Are you going to me? I would certainly like to. Hey everybody, and welcome to the 350 subscriber special. This is pretty much going to be me reading comments on the Palpatine video essay I made a year ago, as well as addressing a couple common things that people comment on that video. But before we get into those, I just want to thank all you guys for your support. I would not have a platform without you. There are some important things I want to say about the channel that will affect video output for most likely the rest of the year, but that will be at the end of the video as a special reward to people who watch this all the way through. Though I guess if that's the only thing you want to hear, you could just skip to the end. There are three things that I want to address before I start reading comments. The first one is Ben Kingsley didn't play Ming the Merciless in the Flash Gordon movie. This mainly bothers me because it's something that I should have been able to fact check really easily when making the video by simply googling the cast of the movie. Ming was actually played by Max von Sydow, a completely different actor. Because on paper, this is a really cool factoid. You know, Ben Kingsley didn't get the role of Palpatine, but he did get the role of a character that probably served as an inspiration to Lucas when creating Star Wars. See, the problem is that I based that on the fact that these two people look the same, which is, you know, I'm sorry for not doing a better job fact checking that. And I do better when researching my newer videos. The second thing is the audio mixing on the video is pretty bad. People have said a lot that, you know, the music is louder than the dialogue. I talk quieter than the music is. Like some people have said that I'm about to cry. I'm currently working on adding accurate subtitles to the video, which hopefully I'm going to be able to add before this video goes up, but it may take longer. Uh, I will put something in the comments of either this video or that video when they're added. I'm sorry to the people who are bothered by it, because like I know it's not a problem exclusive to just that video, but if you're someone that's coming off of watching that video for the first time, uh, the audio mixing is much better in my newer videos. And the third thing is that I've gotten a lot of comments on that video from people who stop listening to it or I click away when I talk about the prequels because they think I hate them just because I criticized them and the way that they were made. I've actually gotten a couple of five paragraph essays on how I'm a sheep just because I don't think they're masterpieces. So, you know, if I'm getting those in the comments, that means I've finally made it as a YouTuber. It's because of comments like this that I find discourse about the prequels online so frustrating because whenever they come up in online discussions, people either talk about them and, you know, they hate them or, you know, they just love them. And, you know, to be perfectly clear, the prequels are my favorite Star Wars movies since they're the ones that I specifically grew up with. I like, I watched the original trilogy, I liked it, but the prequels are the ones that I grew up with. So I have like, you know, I guess I have a bias towards them, but you know, but I think that, you know, only focusing on the flaws or ignoring the flaws altogether doesn't do anybody any good. Like. Is it not possible for us to critically examine these movies for what they are without devolving into this mindless cycle of love and hate that's been going on since they originally came out? I have more that I could say about this, but to briefly summarize, I love the prequels, but I won't ignore their flaws just because it hurts some people's feelings. The only thing I really regret about that section of the video is me being a little meaner to Lucas than I probably should have been, but I still stand by the rest of what I said. Anyways, it's time to read the actual comments. If I ramble a lot throughout the course of the video, it's because the actual comment reading isn't scripted. It's mostly just me genuinely reacting to it. Those of you who have checked out the episodes of Hayden's Entertainment Hour that I've been on know that I tend to ramble like this, especially when I'm having trouble articulating my points. So now, let's take a look at the first comment I'm gonna read. I believe that the Emperor is still out there after Episode 9. He has mastered many powers of the dark side of the Force. I believe his spirit is still out there looking for a new body to pose as. Do you believe that his is still out there? So this is one of the more interesting comments I've gotten on this video. And yeah, it, it is based in uh, the whole thing with Dark Empire and Legends, because you know, the comic that I talked about, that was only the first of three. So yeah, Palpatine didn't die in that comic. He still came back in like new clone bodies and all of that. Which, you know, that ended along with that series. But, um, do I think it's possible for him, his spirit, to be out there in canon looking for a new body to possess? I think it's entirely possible. 
Do I think that Canon is going to do anything with this idea? Probably not. I think that would be like a really interesting idea for like a follow-up comic or show or something like that. But like, I think the chances of it are pretty small. It would be cool to see though. You're wrong about him not knowing about Anakin Palpatine used the Force to create him. There are a whole comic about it. So this is in reference to the point in the video where Palpatine prior to episode 1 did not know about Anakin. Uh, I assume this, like, based off of canon, because in Legends, you know, him and Plagueis were both aware of Anakin's existence, I believe. But um, this comment is also in reference to the uh, second run of Vader comics, where at the very end, I believe, uh, Vader goes into a dark side vision and um, he sees uh, this, uh, Palpatine using the Force to create him inside of Shimmy. And so, like, people took this as a sign that Palpatine was the one that made Anakin. Uh, it wasn't the Force that created him. There wasn't some weird virgin birth. It was Palpatine creating his ultimate tool of destruction. And so, you know, uh, Charles Soule, the person who wrote those comics, and a lot of other Lucasfilm employees have debunked this and said, no, it is, this is not the case because this is the dark side. It is, uh, you know, it's tormenting Vader, pretty much. It's not a reliable narration. Uh, what do I personally think about this? I mean, I, it kind of annoys me that, you know, this would have um, been a good way to, like, you know, add some more additional twists to the whole Chosen One concept that Anakin has going for him. But it's not to say that this is completely without merit, because, you know, since this is effectively a dream sequence, there are some things that we can take out of this. Because this is probably how Vader feels about Palpatine. That Palpatine is the one who is ultimately responsible for turning him into the monster that he is at this point in time. I mean, yeah, Anakin did have a part in that, but it's not like he's going to acknowledge it. <laughs> Have you by chance read the Darth Plaja Yiz novel? It goes into detail about Pal Patani's childhood and time as an apprentice. Also fun fact Plagueis was alive until the very end of Phantom Menace, at which point Pal Patton killed him. So this is a Star Wars book that I have not read yet. I have heard good things about it. I've gotten one or two comments on this video about the Plagueis novel. Uh, it's certainly something that I would definitely check out at some point in time. Because, like, what I've heard of it is good. And yeah, what the commenter says here, it deals with, you know, giving Palpatine a more fleshed out backstory and, you know, giving Plagueis a backstory as well. Maybe someday I'll make a video on it if I think it's worth making something on. The Sith and the Jedi are similar in almost every way, including their quest for greater power. Yeah, from the way this is framed, it seems like it's a quote from something, but... Yeah, I do like how uh, the prequels go in depth and how, like, there's very little separating the Sith and the Jedi when you get down to it. I think the thing that's interesting about the Jedi, especially in the way that the prequels flush them out, is that, you know, there's very little that, you know, defines them as the good guys. It's pretty much just the framing of the story that makes them be good. Because, you know, they are a corrupt religious order at that point in time. And they're only seen as good people because, you know, Yoda and Obi-Wan keep looking at that point in the Order's history with the world's thickest pair of rose-tinted glasses. So they don't really see the same amount of harm that they did that Luke eventually comes to see. But yeah, this is a good comment. I like it, even if it is probably a quote. <laughs> I agree about the sequels not being planned out and that there is no explanation for Palpatine's return but I don't agree with his plans not making sense. He first wanted Kylo's body but when he was redeemed he changed his target to Rey but when he realized that they are a dyad which would restore him and he sucks it out. Okay so first of all before I comment on this comment itself, I want to say like yo thank you to this user specifically and also like a couple different people who pretty much left like explanations of how things work in Star Wars. You know, not like the asshole thing that called me a sheep for hating the prequels, but like, you know, people who felt that, you know, 
I wasn't delivering a point as well as I could have, or that it felt like I didn't understand something. And I appreciate that those people took the time to leave those comments. That being said, I think this gives a good explanation. It makes Palpatine, you know, his whole thing with Rey and Kylo, it makes a bit more sense. I don't know. I think the main problem that I have with episode nine is that, you know, Palpatine is really shallow in that movie. And, you know, not in the like fun kind of shallow way that he is in the other Star Wars movies, because, you know, he is that one dimensional villain, but, you know, he relishes in being that one dimensional villain and, you know, watching him manipulate people and get into fighting each other is really interesting. The way that he is used is what makes him stand out so well. But, you know, episode nine just has him be there without it being set up at all. And, you know, that's a little disappointing. But considering how, like, little, like, tangible thought went into creating the sequels, what else should we have really expected? Yeah, but for anyone just watching the movies, Palpatine is definitely the first type, and I would argue that he works extremely well as that. The best first type villains are the ones that lean into their role in having a blast being evil. Palpatine is a prime example, but this also goes for the better Disney villains. The advantage is that you don't need to spend any more than minimal time on them, but they will still be riveting because they're just fun. So yeah, uh, this comment says pretty much what I said when reading that last comment. But to reiterate, yeah, Palpatine is a one-dimensional villain, but what makes him good is the way that he's used. I would still classify him as the third type of villain, since you understand how he works if you pay attention. But I think it's a lot easier for people to classify him as the first type, because, you know, there are people who don't understand how this planet works, or they don't think it makes sense. This isn't your regular soulless villain either. From the books, his home planet was unjustifiably humiliated by the Republic and his wife died, etc. So yeah, another comment that pops up frequently in the comment section is, you know, people talking about how the Legends version of Grievous is a lot more compelling. Because uh, pretty much uh, the Legends version of Grievous, you know, he was fighting a civil war against a rival species that got support from the Republic. Um, he got a hatred of both the Republic and the Jedi from that conflict. Uh, he eventually became an enforcer for the banking clan. Uh, Dooku arranged a crash that almost killed him. That led to him being like modified and turned into a cyborg. You know, there was an element where like they gave him a blood transfusion from the corpse of Sifo Dyas, which Dooku just keeps in his freezer because they wanted to see if that could actually give him, you know, force sensitive abilities, but that didn't work out. So, um, the Legends version of Grievous is a lot more compelling to a lot of people. Um, I think, you know, the canon version still applies to this classification of, like, the first type of villain, you know, generic. They have an interesting personality, but, you know, there's not really that much to them. I mean, I think it would be cool to see, like, some of those elements return to canon, but I don't know. It might take a while for canon to actually develop some of that type of stuff into a story. Arkin is a wonderful, sympathetic villain in Swatra, and to anyone that hasn't played or does play but lacks a subscription, I urge you play through the Katet and Cot Fest stories, you will thank me. I have gotten a couple comments about the old Republic RPG since you know i reference how you know that dark empire backstory you know it kind of got reused for vitae in that game um it is a series that i have not played with. i've heard good things about i love the trailers for those games there are some of my favorite pieces of star wars media unironically at some point in the future i would love to do just a big old gigantic video about the entire Knights of the Old Republic time period, you know, talking about the old Dark Horse comics, the two video games and the RPG, because, um, you know, that was like something that was one of my biggest exposures to Star Wars as a kid, you know, reading those Dark Horse comics and, you know, the old expanded universe guide book that they made. But yeah, um, Maybe someday that will be something that I make in the future. Thrawn, I'm about to end this man's whole career. Funnily enough, Thrawn is a character that I plan on covering at some point. I think he's an interesting character. I, the Thrawn Trilogy is a book series that I eventually will 
finish reading one day, <laughs> probably for a video. Um, because you know, I think he works in that. I think the new canon books about him are great. I, I do not like his incorporation to Rebels. I think that it stunts a lot of his character, especially because of you know not only in the way that he's used, but also the time period that he's in, not really allowing for him to go full Sherlock Holmes without you know destroying the rebellion in its infancy. But, you know, if I ever make a video on Rebels or on him, I'll probably get more into it there. But you know stay tuned because you know that may come at some point it makes vader's death pointless so this is a topic that you know i strongly disagree with you know like this was something that a lot of buzz was made about back when episode 9 came out because you know palpatine surviving um it removes you know the weight of vader killing him and, you know, this was even something that, like, back when Dark Empire first came out that people complained about. Uh, I disagree, because I think it's a really reductive way to look at both characters. The point of Vader's death isn't that, you know, he kills Palpatine. I mean, he does sacrifice himself to kill, you know, the biggest bad in the universe, but, like, the important thing about that moment is that, you know, he returns to the light because he refuses to let Palpatine kill, like, the last remaining member of his family. You know, like, the last remains of Padme, like, all that good, mushy stuff. Um, the importance of that scene is Vader killing the person that is somewhat responsible for ruining his life. It's also a reductive way to look at Palpatine, because, you know, Palpatine, being the master manipulator that he is, he has no reason to, like, respect this fact that Vader killed himself so that he could kill him. You know, because of how he works, I assume that he would have a plan to survive anyway. It's one of the few things about him coming back in episode 9 that makes sense. But yeah, um, this is something I disagree with, and it's, you know, I think it's a bad way to look at these two characters. How do people dislike the Ewoks? They're one of my favorite parts of the movie. I think that the reason why, like, some people hate the Ewoks is that, you know, they're an aspect of Star Wars that's specifically marketed towards children. You know, the prequels had Jar Jar Binks, sequels had Porgs. And, you know, like, it's harder for adults to get into, like, something that is so, like, you know, intentionally made for kids. Even though, you know, there's the whole thing about Star Wars being made for kids, you know, it's stuff like the Ewoks that is a, you know, aspect that it's hard to kind of brush off. I don't hate the Ewoks, by the way. I think I need to make that clear because of, like, all the comments in this video about people who think I hate the prequels. Um, no, I, I like the Ewoks. Um, I think it's a good incorporation of, you know, the, like, under-civilized natives overcoming the powerful... Uh, industrialized bad guys you know it's nice and fun i don't have any problems with it what i expected to see in episode one was darth vader stormtroopers and dealings with the force like star wars stuff and the whole queen jar jar and the droid troops were weak it just wasn't star wars enough we need wookies sith lords stormtroopers millennium falcon and smugglers i think they caught on with the recent movies episode three was a decent comeback but it was like they were trying to make up for two bad movies rouge one and the sequ sequels now that's star wars and they felt like Star Wars. This is probably one of the weirder comments that's on this video. It's weird because like most of the comments about the prequels are just like, you know, people hating me for being the slightest bit critical of them. And this one just, <laughs> I don't know, man. It's just weird to see uh, someone complaining that, you know, the prequels are bad because they were different from the original trilogy. Like, I cannot tell if this man is like, you know, mocking me. <laughs> it could possibly be. Um, you know, even some of the replies in this comment think that the person who made it is just trolling. Or, you know, they're the problem with the modern film industry. Um, but like, treating this comment as if it's serious, you know, I'm glad the prequels are visually distinct from the original trilogy. I think a big problem with the sequels is that, you know, they use the original trilogy as a crutch so much that, you know, the crutch breaks. They rely a lot on uh, familiar imagery. It's like 
the only lesson that the people making the sequels took from them is that, you know, the prequels are bad because they're different. And, you know, that's probably the worst possible lesson you could have taken from these movies. But yeah, this is just a weird comment. <laughs> so that's where I'm going to end the video. The, the important thing I want people who stuck around until the video was over to know is that there is a good chance that I will not be uploading this frequently for a while. That's because as this video goes up, my fall semester for college will be starting, or it has started. Uh, I'm not sure how it's going to affect video production. In the past, you know, when I made the Palpatine video, I was taking online classes because of COVID, and, you know, they didn't have set class times for, like, meeting through Zoom and that type of thing. So that gave me a lot more freedom to be able to, like, you know, have that time for college and also have that time for editing videos for YouTube. At the moment, it seems like my classes will be in person. I don't know if that will change. So for now, I'm going to assume that it's going to have a big effect on, you know, my spare time because I have to balance, you know, classes and homework, my job, YouTube and, you know, other personal projects. The Boba Fett video is going to be the main thing I'm going to be working on after this video goes up. And I'll try to, you know, edit the Snyder video as well in the background. Since I've pushed it to the back burner, I actually haven't been able to work on it. You know, the idea of having it be on the back burner is that, you know, I would edit a little bit here or there. But even though it's been like a couple of uploads since I did that, I still think there's only like 30 seconds actually edited. Uh, I'm not sure how long it will take to come out, uh, but there is a, a very small possibility that it may come out next year, depending on how long it takes to edit. I don't want to set a deadline in stone for either the Boba Fett video or the Snyder video, since I usually overshoot deadlines that I set for myself, like how I did with the uh, Lighthouse and Battlefront 2 videos. But I will try to put out smaller videos whenever possible so that my channel isn't completely dead. Anyways, I hope that you guys will understand and be patient with me during the gaps in between uploads, and I'll see you guys the next time I upload. Peace.